one thing that's quite often asked to me is that, oh, uh, what should I do to make my patients to exercise? Because I have been asking them to exercise and saying that's good and it's not working. And obviously I'm not impressed that this is not working. Uh, it's like if you would try to go to someone that smokes and say, oh, stop smoking, that's not good for you. What are the real chances for having these people uh, these people start, stop smoking? And it's like the same with exercise. So the best way, in my view, to actually infect, to support patients to start exercising, uh, and some stuff that we have seen in the literature. So the first one is that if the psychiatrist or the psychologist is active, higher the chances of the patients to start exercising because it can create a, a stronger connection. The psychologist is given the example, and this is helpful. Uh, uh, Oscar, as I said, has a study on that showing that psychiatrists that are more active, they are more likely to promote and be successful in promoting uh, exercise for their patients. And also, uh, a, a part of that, uh, something that we should uh, take in consideration is that how much time uh, takes for a psychologist or for someone like, actually encourage someone to change and make a viable way to people change their behavior. Mm. So the first thing is that just saying that exercise is good for you, go exercise, or even prescribing, do it for three, four, five per week, 20 minutes or so. This is just not effective at all. Mm. We have seen in the literature that uh, the best way of actually promoting exercise is trying to build and to explore according to patients' preferences, what would be the most suitable and preferable exercise for that patient. Just telling them to exercise is not sufficient at all. Everybody knows that exercise can help your, your physical and mental health. That's, there's no new in that. What should change in my view is that every and all professional in uh, working and attending to someone with depression or any other mental health uh, problem uh, this profession should try to explore how the best way and uh, to make that people actually exercise given their context. Like exploring, for example, what would be the best exercise for that patient, exploring how the patient feel uh, when doing or after doing exercise, uh, exploring what the best time for that patient, uh, exploring if someone, if he or she enjoys doing with someone else, listening to music or just quietly. So actually trying to make people understand what would be the best exercise for that specific person. That's the best way. And this takes, takes time. Like uh, it's not uh, just saying exercise is good. It's quite quick. It's like, okay, just do it, but it's not effective. So. Uh, the overall recommendation for, uh, from uh, us, researchers in the field, is that uh, we, the, the health professional that's trying to encourage patients actually try to explore uh, how to make the patient exercise in their real life, given their context and given their preferences. Not just, not just saying uh, exercise is good and go for it. Yeah. It doesn't work. This is an extremely important point, the adherence problem. I've seen it termed as the no-do gap, that people know exercise is good for them, yet doing it is a different uh, problem and there's a gap between you know the knowledge and, and the doing. And Steve Petrizello, I think he was the PhD supervisor for um, Patty um, Ekakakis. I've seen him term this as exercise is a best buy but a tough sell. So you know, great benefits and everyone knows of it. And there's been this proliferation explosion of knowledge on you know, the great outcomes that exercise has both physically and mentally, yet rates of physical activity on a national and global scale are still very poor in terms of people meeting the national guidelines, right? So this is the, the, the big problem that is yet to be unlocked is how to bridge that no-do gap. Yes, exactly. And this is something that uh, Ekekakis is trying to uh, explore. And the answer that he gives is the one that I adopted, uh, is that people know that's good, but they 
they don't feel that is nice doing. <laughs> so the effective response for most people uh, or the effective memory of exercise for most people is not a positive memory. If you ask many people uh, or some people if they like or if they enjoy exercising, some people will say, no, I hate it. <laughs> I'd rather prefer staying in my sofa just watching TV. And it's quite, it can be, it can be, it can be quite true. So I can make you feel very badly exercising. I know how to do that, but we have not been trained to make people feel good when exercising. And this is a, a problem of the field. We have been so much interested in intensity and the physiological effects of different intensities and the physiological effects of different volumes, but we haven't explored uh, how these variables can affect the effects of the person can affect the emotional and how we how we should work with these variables to make someone feel good when exercising. So uh, people that have uh, uh, positive, um, affective memories from exercise, they are more likely to keep exercising and to enjoy of the, uh, uh, doing exercise. And this is something that we should explore. And this is why I say maybe light uh, exercise could be a good option for someone that have not exercised previously because you have higher chances of that people end uh, or conclude the session saying, okay, that was nice. I, I, I like it doing. I, I, I feel I felt good and I'm here tomorrow. Uh, so this is like probably the missing part. Uh, people can make people feel very bad and we should take this into consideration when prescribing exercise. And if you use the same exercise session or model or prescription for a group of people, some people will say, okay, that was very nice. And some people will say, no, that was awful. <laughs> that was terrible. This is the challenge we have here is how to tailor the intervention based on the effective response uh, that, that people may have from exercise. And this requires a fine-grained approach to try to uh, explore session by session, or at least to try to make the, the patient or the people understand how they feel doing exercise and how what did work, what didn't work, what made made him or her feel bad, and what made him or her feel good. And exploring these alternatives is like probably the best way. If, you, if we can uh, try to uh, make people exercise feeling good most of the time, well, this is how we can probably change this scenario and make people benefit more from exercise as well. Yeah, yeah. So to counter that, anecdotally, speaking to a lot of GPs or physicians here in Australia, uh, a lot of them in terms of prescribing exercise for mental health feel that they need concrete guidelines. They need to be told that then X, Y, and Z exercise for depression, X, Y, and Z exercise for, you know, 10 minutes, whatever, 20 minutes of this type, this intensity, um, you know, they want those kind of black and white guidelines. Now, it seems like from our conversation, from the research, that's kind of the opposite approach that you know, you're advocating for and that rather than looking for the magic dose or the magic pill equivalent of exercise, the best way is to adopt more of the health behavior change uh, approaches and in individualizing it for a person. So something like self-determination theory, which I know you're familiar with, um, and that's the way that research should go, is looking at um, individualizing health behavior change rather than what's the most effective dose, what's the most effective dose. Is that is that, is that a fair summary of, of how things sit from your point of view? Yes, that's a very fair summary and that's exactly the message. Uh, I, we know that uh, from a psychiatrist or for, from a, a health professional that's that has limited uh, time, that has lots of pressure of other things. I know that they just want a, a receipt that's saying, okay, just do that. And this is 
probably what would work for you. But we have seen in the field that this is not how it works. <laughs> we have seen that we, we have to consider individual preferences and individual values and individual affective responses. And this is quite challenging. Uh, we, have, we have seen in the field that we have to try to standardize an approach, in my view, to assist health professionals to try to change behavior uh, and providing maybe steps on how to explore these points that I, we just discussed. Uh, but this is not just an easy uh, prescription, it's not like just going in and doing that because that doesn't work at all. If you, say, if you just tell someone that he, he or she should stop smoking and just prescribe, maybe you should stop smoking every day and start smoking five, uh, five days per week and then four and then three and then one per week and then you can just quit. And that doesn't work. This is not what happens in real life. So why should we believe that that approach would work for making someone exercise? It doesn't work at all. It doesn't work for diet. It doesn't work for any other uh, behavioral change intervention. So isn't, it, probably, it probably won't work for exercise at all. So we should consider using different approaches and more complex approaches indeed. Uh, it approaches that requires more time to explore uh, and to discuss with the patients. But it doesn't matter if you are just spending five minutes and that's not working at all. Uh, it is not relevant. So it's much better to spend like 20, 40 minutes per month to discuss something that can have a real impact on the patient's life. Yeah, this, I mean, I could, I could talk to you for hours on this, um, Felipe. I've, I don't know if I told you this, but I've just started my um, PhD here in Australia and uh, I'm looking quite closely at adherence to lifestyle behaviors um, in university students. And one of the studies I'm looking to run is, is like a mixed method study looking at health practitioners and their use of exercise prescription um, with young people. What are their barriers? And you brought up one, which is time. You know, as, as a GP here in Australia, our uh, public health system is under such you know, strain and, and you're right, you know, at least here, they just don't have um, time and are under such huge workload pressures to have these conversations. But in terms of where we're at now and health behavior change theories, are there particular models or frameworks that health practitioners can follow that are effective in increasing the adherence of health behavior in general, if not exercise? So David Van Comfort, a colleague uh, of us from Belgium, has done lots of work exploring how to use the self-determination theory to uh, facilitate and integrate uh, uh, and to do these uh, behavioral changes. So uh, like creating a sense of belongingness or assisting the, the the patient to create this sense of belongingness, uh, to try to make an exercise session that the patient can feel that he's competent in doing that, like trying to propose an exercise that's actually doable and feasible for the patient. Uh, it's something that can be very, very positive in terms of adherence. Uh, yeah. Um, that's that are the things that can really, really uh, help patients. If you consider the self-determination theory and try to change, uh, be, to change the behavior using the autonomous motivation, trying to explore what is important, what's relevant for that patient in that context, in that moment, it's like something that we can uh, can use as a background theory. Obviously, this is not that easy <laughs> because when I say, okay, just uh, use that theory is not that helpful for uh, physicians and for, for GPs. But basically, based on this theory, you can try to uh, ex explore with the patient what are the values, what are the feelings, what are 
uh, the views of the patients regarding that exercise and that 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 can help.